that fact, if he's going to review his entire scientific career, <laughs> which is going to be hard to do in one hour, and... Who said that I was going to take only an hour? <laughs> Thank you, Raj. So, uh, so I could just hear people talking coming up in the elevator and, uh, and in the hallway. So, when you get to be uh, to the six years, you know, uh, you, you can't find any good sense to talk about. So you got to talk about the past. Uh, but that's not true. It turns out. And I could have talked to you about soar. All right. So let's start. This is actually this is actually worked by Bob Dernbos and Milan Hamby. And so um, so here we have a program of about two thousand productions and it runs from uh, zero decision cycles, which is its basic cycle time, on uh, fifty thousand decision cycles and it's chunking all the way. And so here's the number of chunks built. And so we actually built eight thousand chunks by now. So you're looking at one of the largest production systems ever built. And so the real interesting question is what's true out there? Okay, and so, uh, so as all of you know, in this uh, in this school in this department, um, the way SOAR is built out of a big production system, and thus there is behind SOAR a huge set of rules. Ten thousand of them by the time you make the two thousand original and eight thousand. There is a big reader there, which is a device for trying to execute those rules, those um, uh, rules efficiently. And so here's a picture for the same thing, which shows the growth of, uh, of nodes in the reader net. And there's about 20,000 nodes to begin with, and we're getting up towards 130,000, 125,000 nodes at the end. So the reader net is really big, okay? And you don't want to look at these. There is within each, within each task that it runs, there are some internal things that get created for support. So you really want to look only at the envelope the underneath envelope, okay? So now if you believe everybody, that system should be slowing down like mad, okay? It's so big. That's the Steve Mitten story, for those of you who remember Steve Mitten. So here we have the time per decision cycle in seconds and on a log scale. And in fact, as you look, there's essentially no indication of what we call the average growth effect. No indication that things are slowing down, even though we're already up to about 10,000 productions. Actually, we've been tracking this as we're getting big. When you look here, there's absolutely no indication. Now, maybe you can begin to see that we're finally going to get some average growth effect. So here we have a really big production system. Of course, we're just getting started. We will soon find out what it's like when it's sort of out to here or out to here, when we get 20,000 productions. So I could have told you about all these things, okay? <laughs> but when Mary asked me to give this lecture, I think this was a full letter he sent to everybody, he said, why don't you step back? Instead of just talking about your technical thing, why don't you talk about something uh, uh, sort of more general that reflects on the larger, uh, the larger issues? That's what I decided to do. Uh, after all, if I look at myself, uh, and I measure myself in decision cycles, and you believe sort of theory of cognition, then I'm running at about 10 to the 9th decision cycles. This thing is only running at 10 to the 5th decision cycle, 10 to the 4th decision cycles. So I've got quite a bit of, uh, of extra time going than it does. And uh, so I probably am more interesting than it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll be quite a while before we get that system out to the end of the 9th decision cycle. That makes sense you got Alan. <laughs> Well, it's chunking six, one chunk every six decision cycles. That linear curve showed that. Extrapolate out, multiply it by 10 to the fifth, so I've got, I've got uh, 10,000 times 10 to the fifth. That's 10 to the eighth chunks. I've got 10 to the eighth chunks, not coming my first 18 years, when presumably I was learning nothing. All right? <laughs> I said I'll reflect on my... Uh, not just on my career, but on sort of scientific styles might be interesting to the group at hand, since most of you uh, 
either haven't yet adopted a scientific style or probably don't like one that you're, that you're in. So let's talk about scientific styles. Styles of scientific lives. Uh, a bunch of floating maxims around when we do this. The maxim associated with this slide is uh, to each scientific life its own style, but each style defines a separate one. Okay? So I want to just talk about different styles because I only exhibit one of these and there are lots of other styles. So the first one is the one I associate with algorithm complexity theories, which I call a nomadic existence. <laughs> out that it's easy to prove theorems, and it's very hard to prove theorems that are not almost like the theorems that everybody else has proved. So every so often in complexity theory, someone proves a really new interesting theorem which opens up a new area. And then everybody picks up their attention, they all run over into this new area, and they, and they pick up all the interesting nuggets around, and pretty soon you look around and there's nothing around except, except nuggets that are like everybody else's nuggets. Then finally somebody gets a new one, and everyone picks up their tents, okay? <laughs> and that's the way you live your life. Okay, you live your life moving from one theoretical area to another as it opens up. Second kind of scientific style is sort of a general substantive theme. Gordon Bell actually is a pretty interesting thing, although he's moved a little bit. He really played out the first half of his career Understanding what the nature of computer architectures was that has shifted for the last 15 or 20, 20 years into understanding multiprocessors, he's not focused on any particular thing. There is a particular machine that he wants to build. He wants to understand the space of multiprocessors and how to build effective multiprocessors. That, that is, in one sense, a uh, kind of a lifetime effort of his. Although when I talked to him recently, he was sort of running out of gas and asked him what to do next. <laughs> There is another style that's quite different, which I've labeled a sequence of strategic objectives. A kind of paradigm example was a scientist I knew about 20 years ago by the name of Werner Reichert, who at the time I knew him was studying the control system in insects that govern their flight. His view of the world, he was very articulate, was that you pick a particular scientific idea, that idea takes of the order of five years to build up and get deep enough so that you really can do something, and then you pick another one. So life for Werner is a sequence of five years, not only five years projects, each one picked by looking at the state of science at the time. There are, in fact, the number is legion, a number of people, and I see lots of them around here, to, for whom the goal is simply to work on interesting problems. Or you simply, in fact, if you can work on interesting problems, that's all you ask of each particular day. There's another variation on this, which is not so pleasant, in which you look <laughs> at whatever seems publishable. You see a little project in life that looks like it's publishable. Let's go for that one. Okay? And I know a number of people whose scientific lives are a random walk among the publishable material. <laughs> they, of course, shall all be nameless. Uh, the last style I want to discuss is a single ultimate scientific question in which a scientist got a real goal out there, a scientific goal. I have three examples. Kurt Simon is now famous for the fact that a single scientific goal of understanding how it is that humans can, who are governed by bounded rationality, how all the phenomena surrounding human cognition and decision making can be understood by that, that is in fact has driven his entire scientific career. Uh, I haven't checked this one out with Raj, but my belief about Raj is that he really has speech recognition as his, as his only fundamental scientific goal. Okay? Now Raj does lots of different things. He works on multimedia, works on vision, he's worked on robotics. Only when he turns back to speech, do you see some sort of fantastic and interesting thing happens, and he keeps coming back to it. So for Raj, I infer, and I repeat, I didn't ask him, I infer that his life is not all those things, it is really speech as the thing that he wants to really see done with his scientific life. For myself, I'm again one of these types of characters. My style is to deal with a single problem, namely the nature of the human mind. That is the one problem that I've cared about through my scientific career and it will last me all the way, all the way to the end. So let's look at that a little bit. So my style is, a, is a, the pursuit of a single desire, that's the desire of the title, is the 
Nature of the human mind, the maximum is that uh, science is in the details, okay? Now, what is the question? For me, this question is, how can mind occur in the physical, human mind occur in the physical universe? We, you know, we now know that the world is governed by physics. We now understand the way biology nestles comfortably within that. Uh, the issue is, how will mind do that as well? And the second part of this is this answer must have the details. I've got to know how the gears clank and how the pistons go and all the rest of that detail. That's that question for I, and it's not the same as a bunch of other questions. For instance, it's not the same as what is the nature of intelligence. That is the AI question. And although I have been associated with AI for a large part of my life, that's not the question that drives me. This is the question that drives me, and they're not the same. It's not the Simon question, which is essentially, this is kind of an abbreviated version to get it into a single line. How does bounded rationality explain all of human behavior? It's not the same question as that. Although of course, those questions are close enough so that Herb and I have managed collaboration for 40 years, but in fact, it leads me, my question leads me down to worry about the architecture. It leads Herb to worry about other areas of human life and how to explain them in terms of bounded rationality. It is also not the issue of the nature, it's not the issue of the mind-body problem, that's philosopher's question. Uh, now, they may have the same answer. It may be that the answer to my question and the answer to their question is the same, but it turns out, of course, that my question is a simple scientific question, it may be an ultimate one and hard to get at, but it is a scientific question. If in, and the mind-body is not, it's a philosophical question. And in fact, if the mind-body were cast as a scientific question, all the philosophers would do different things than they now do about it. They go up in the laboratory. <laughs> but it's also not, what is the nature of the brain? That's another question which may have exactly the same answer. Mostly because there's really only one answer out there, all right? The same answer, but in fact, if this was the question, I would be doing things very different than the way I'm doing them. Now, you do need to realize, if you have before, that there is this sort of collection of ultimate scientific questions, and if you're lucky enough to get out by one of these, that will just do you for the rest of their life. Why does the universe exist? When did it start? What's the nature of life? Why is evolution so stable? All of these things are questions of a depth about the nature of our universe that they can hold you for an entire life and you're then just a little ways into them. That's not true. There are in fact some of these, what is the nature of life, which have been essentially answered compared to where they were a hundred years ago. Uh, there are some other rather interesting ones in this list, like the sea and Adam. Uh, there were a number of people, not too many, whose real goal in life was to finally see an Adam. Having been told by the philosophers that uh, atoms and electrons and all the rest of those things were mere creations of the human mind. And they weren't really out there. Then what do you want to do? Well, you want to go see one, because if you see one, then in fact you know it's real as a chair. And that's of course happened. Now and you probably take it all granted. So this, in fact all four of these, well, Herb's question is very interesting. Because nobody ever quite posed the question that way for Herb did, whereas all the rest of these are sort of obvious questions, they're just deep questions. So there's the desire. Uh, a question that can ask naturally at that point is, if that's what scientific life is, when did it start? For me, okay? So the maxim here is that scientific problem chooses you, you don't choose it. You don't go pick a scientific problem and decide that you are going to go and understand the nature of the human mind. Uh, for me, it was certainly not the problem at age 17, <laughs> where what I wanted to be most was a forest ranger. And as a matter of fact, I spent one summer up in the high Sierras uh, being one of those kinds, except what I actually did was to take gangrenous calves' livers, frozen, and chopped them up and dry them up so that the trout fingerlings could have something to eat for a summer. It didn't seem like a great career to me. <laughs> it 
certainly was not at age 19, but I wanted to be, I say a scientist, I was out of Kini at the time, that's the place where the atomic bomb testing was done, and in the company of all kinds of scientists and medical doctors and so forth concerned with this, and I was clearly caught up in the excitement, although I hardly knew what it was to be a scientist, but I certainly wanted to be one of those. In fact, I was probably a good example of, I want to work on interesting problems, okay? I suppose that's actually a Chinese scientist. <laughs> all right. It was not at age 22 when I wanted most of all to be an optical engineer. That's an optical engineer. Who would ever want to be an optical engineer? <laughs> well, it turns out, as an undergraduate at Stanford, I worked on X-ray microscopy. And most of you think of an X-ray as something which goes through a material, so you can't build a microscope with it. You can't bend the waves. But it turns out that if you take a surface and you shine the X-ray at a glancing angle, you can get enough index of reflection so you can actually focus the X-rays and make it through a microscope. And I was all caught up in the engineering and the physics of doing this as an undergraduate for several years, and therefore I clearly wanted to be an optical engineer. Uh, it hadn't happened yet at age 27. What I wanted to be was an organizational scientist. Now by this time, uh, I actually was a scientist, as John McDermott would say, I actually are one, okay? Um, because, in fact, we had started to study large social organizations. These were air defense organizations. This was right in the time of the Cold War. And we were studying, there were radar systems all up and down the coast. And we were studying the behavior and performance of those 40-man organizations as they tried to, to interpret the air picture flowing that seemed through their radars. And I was engaged in organizational experiments, and they were very successful and very interesting. And at that point, I clearly wanted to be in organizational science. But it didn't happen then. It actually happened at age 27.7. <laughs> on a Friday afternoon, and I can't remember quite which Friday it was, but on a Friday afternoon in mid-November, and another fellow by the name of Oliver Selfridge came to Rand, I was at Rand at the time, uh, and he visited and he talked about their system. They were producing a system on what was called the memory test computer for whirlwind, and they were building a pattern recognition system which had several loops of self adaptation in it. And I listened, and this wasn't a big seminar, he just got in a room with about three or four of us and described this effort for a couple of hours, and I listened to that, and I knew, okay, this is a genuine conversion experience. Experience. I walked out of that place, I, what I knew actually was computers can do any kind of complex process, including learning, abstraction, you name it. That, that was a sufficient the collection of mechanisms there, was sufficiently rich that we were on our way, okay? Um, it was indeed a conversion experience, and I'm an apostate Christian, so I can tell you I've been through conversion experiences before, and <laughs> this is one of those. I went into the office of my colleague, Cliff Shaw, we weren't our colleagues on AI at that time, but we had been working together on, on the simulations that we were doing for this sort of thing. And I repeated verbatim practically what Oliver Selfridge said in the previous hour. Then I went home that weekend and I designed a couple of whole systems back, and I've never turned back since. Okay. So that's what I mean by saying that the science problem chooses you, you don't choose. I suppose you can say, well, I certainly was engaged in a hell of a search doing all the early <laughs> years of my life, and I finally came home in that, in that one hour. Uh, now the insight, of course, was not the nature of the human mind. That was already there from the kind of organizational studies. It was that we could understand by mechanistic means how the mind could operate. Now, as I sort of went over this thing, an odd insight, insight's the wrong word, an odd notion occurred to me. Uh, this is November 54. That's only about a year and a half before what is usually considered this great burst of activity. Logic theorists, list processing invented and used, GPS, general problem solver, invented and used, the chess program occurred all in the course of a year. That's only about a year away, a year and a half away from that thing. And absolutely nothing, if you go back and examine that, presages why this burst of uh, activity should occur. Very compressed in time. So here we are. So there's desire, and we've got it started. Finally got me wa quitting wandering around 
in Antarctica. But then there are diversions, okay? And uh, so the maxim is diversions occur. They really do, and all you can do is to make them count. Uh, and then you can salvage whatever is possible for your main goal. So I want to illustrate that. So here's the first diversion. <coughs> Gordon Bell came down, gotten tired of deck, and uh, so he showed up, uh, and he couldn't stand going to MIT. Uh, so, uh, so he showed up here at CMU to be a professor for a while, and, uh, uh, and so he was writing a book about all his experience in building machines, and he came around, and he gave me a chapter. And I read this chapter, and it was so awful, you cannot imagine. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have heard Gordon speak. <laughs> but Gordon had a speech like this all the time, okay? And he writes worse. Okay? <laughs> so, so he's a new faculty member. He's to be nice to new faculty member. You know, that's kind of the culture. So I started to edit this, this manuscript for Gordon to help him out. And now Gordon, in fact, will organize anything that moves slower than he is, okay? <laughs> and so first thing I knew, I was co-opted as a co-author. And there I was with a real diversion on my hand because the book was out of control from the beginning. Okay? <laughs> and as you can see, this is essentially a, what is that? Six years. Six years of this effort. So you've got to make it count. Now what actually happened was that within that, for entirely bookish reasons, because we couldn't stand the plethora of notations from all the different reprints that we were doing, we invented two notations called PMS and ISP. Most of you know what ISP is, instruction set processor language. That has become, in fact, a, a fairly standard term. Probably nobody knows what PS, PMS is anymore, standing for process and research language, a language of computer configurations. But both of these were major scientific contributions. That's what I mean by making it count. As far as salvage was concerned, I got one big thing out of this, what, six, seven years of experience. Namely, I understood what architectures were about. I don't think I understood architectures about when I went in. In fact, the field didn't either. One of the things that book did was to help pull together a nascent notion within the computer field of architectures and the space of architectures. And that's really one of the main contributions of the book. But I sort of salvaged this little piece from this huge, from this huge effort. All right. So here's the second diversion is Raj Reddy in the speech understanding system. That again goes from what? Seven years, 1970 to 76. Uh, there was a small part of this which was going to help the DARPA community, which needed to have a head of a little committee to tell it to do speech understanding research when what it knew it wanted to do was speech understanding research. That's the fun of committees in our society is when everyone knows what they want to do, you create a committee to tell you. And so I was innocent into this whole thing, uh, Larry Robert sort of tapped me. But the real reason, it turns out, was that Raj was here. Raj was one of the people who deeply knew he wanted to work on speech recognition research. So in fact, the diversion was really to help Raj as well. Okay, in fact, if you tell you privately now that the whole thing is over, it was more to help Raj than to help the DARPA community. <laughs> so we ran this speech understanding thing. I ended up being chairman of the steering committee. I ended up writing a god book about the whole thing. <laughs> on and on. It was, in some sense, in its own terms, it was indeed a major success. Uh, all I got out of it, that's the salvage part, all I got out of it was at least I understood sensory processing a little bit, which I'd never understood before, and that helps me a little bit understanding the nature of human, uh, of human cognition and so forth. But, uh, but again, in terms of maxim, if you're going to go be diverted, make count. And we need the speech understanding system count. So let's go on. A lot of diversions. Here's the third diversion. This is Stu Card and Tom Moran and the psychology of, uh, of HCI. Again, lasted for what? 11 years, all right? <clears throat> One of the points I will make, I might as well make it now, is these diversions seem to last a long time. <laughs> And since the point of diversions is don't let them really get in the way, always come back to the main goal, it really pays to have a long life. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so the diversion 
was, Noelle, my wife, and I are both creatures of San Francisco, both born and raised in San Francisco, so we're West Coasters, and worse than that, okay? Um, San Francisco at that time was a very attractive place, um, and uh, Pittsburgh was not so attractive as it is now. So there sort of was a need to get something on the West Coast that would help us sort of go back there all the time. So that, that was the division. And so we generated, when Xerox Park came into existence in 1970, uh, 71, we generated a consultant ship out there, and we invented the notion that maybe it was time to apply all that we understood about cognition to some area, like uh, how humans interact with computers, or how they did programming, or something like that. And then I convinced two of my graduate students, uh, Picard and Tom Moran here, that what they wanted most in the world was to go out and join me at Xerox Park. <laughs> well, I say here, and just consulted out there first. Uh, we would create this little unit to go build this thing. All right, so that's all diversion. Now it turns out that on the issue side, we sort of developed strongly and early, 1975-76, the notion of root cognitive skills, we devoted a class of models called GOMS for characterizing when humans are operating in a routine fashion in the cognitive skill. Um, we helped establish, there wasn't enough room over here to say it, but we actually helped establish the whole field of HCI as an endeavor. In fact, the title of our book, which is called Human Children Interaction, uh, is sort of the first major use of that term as far as I'm, as far as I'm aware. Uh, so, you know, there we are again. If you're going to be diverted, at least make good use of it. Now, what did I salvage? I actually salvaged quite a bit from this effort. Um, Barney won't probably like my talk about it as salvage, but that's all right. <laughs> a piece of this, a kind of a little add-on piece of this, was the developing of something called the model human processor, which was an attempt to kind of characterize from what psychology knew, cognitive psychology, all the activities that occurred in the human as they were interacting with the machine. And that gave me a view of what it would be to have a unified theory of cognition. Okay. So I had a real activity, a presaging activity, that set me up for understanding that when I came back to that a number of years later. So I actually salvaged a lot out of that one. Well, there's at least one more diversion. This is Zod. Don McCracken and George Robertson in a system called Zog. Um, the diversion is again two great graduate students in a system which nobody heard about called LSTAR. We'll come to, we won't come to LSTAR very much, but I'll touch on it. Um, in which, for a number of odd reasons, but mostly because George and Don were real excited, uh, we set out to produce what we would now call a hypermedia system. Now, we didn't invent hypermedia systems, and in fact, there was another system around called the Thomas system, which had a network of 30,000 frames, okay? Uh, and we essentially said, that's important from a computer science point of view. Let us create a, these guys are a bunch of medical characters. Let us create a version like that in the computer science world. And in fact, we actually helped them push the notion of hypermedia around. We attempted a major application. We did it. Uh, it's, it's a little clear for reasons I won't go into here whether it was a success or not. This was in fact putting a whole Zog system, which is this big hyper, hypertext network, putting a whole Zog system on, uh, on the power of carrier to help manage the carrier's operation. Um, again, in some sense, if you're going to go diverted, get some use out of it. Get some general use out of it. What was there to salvage? Turns out there was only one thing to salvage that I could see. The one thing that happened in our getting into that was that a lot of people, two, three, something like this, a lot of people were really convinced that this network of 30,000, which they soon envisioned being 300,000 and so on, was essentially an artificial intelligence. Now they were wrong. They were absolutely wrong. But that was you know, when, when Bruce Axman, one of the characters like this, who knew about this system, which was out of the computer science world, so it was way over on the side in the medical world, came to me, he said, that's where artificial intelligence really is, you ought to go understand it. Okay, what I learned out of this is, there are no shortcuts to intelligence, 
Higher media has nothing to do with intelligence. Uh, it's, uh, it's not the nature of how humans think, and so and those are not uh, connected anymore. But that's the one lesson that I got. So what are the points of note? One of the peculiar ones, but it tells you something, is that all the diversions were for social reasons. Not a single diversion was for scientific reasons, although, if you buy the maxim, once you're trapped in a diversion, make it count. Okay? Uh, that fits, by the way, if I'm devoted to trying to understand the nature of the human mind, what business do I have to get a diversion from scientific reasons? There's got to be some other kind of reasons. And they all were. I like to help Raj and do things like that. All right. They all lasted a long time, but I always came back to the basic scientific issues. My basic scientific goal. All right. There are other things besides diversions. I mean, you know, desires and diversions talk is over. We've gotten through the title. That's all we have to do. Not quite. There are some other things. Um, there are failures, for instance. So let's talk about failures. So the maxim here is, embrace failure as part of success. I always like to say, you know, one failure a week is just bracing and good for you. <laughs> Your problem is to use it to somehow advance towards the main goal, something I've not always been successful in doing. So now I'm going to tell you about a couple of failures. Here's the first one. It's a system called Merlin, which I did with Jim. You'll notice a subtle shift. In the previous thing where I talked about these diversions, the name came first and the project second. Now in these failures, the project comes first and the name comes second. Because it's the project that failed, not the people who were on. All right. So this is an effort with Jim Moore, a graduate student here, Richard Young, who is now in Cambridge, who was here as a research assistant with me. Again, it lasts for what? Six or seven years. There was a kernel idea behind them, which was again the attempt to do the main line, namely that all thought was in one situation as some other further specified. So if you could see the current situation as the goal just further specified in some way, then you could see how to get the goal. So everything was to be built on a generalized form of mapping in which you would sort of map everything into everything else and nature of those maps would in fact be the flow structure of thought. Uh, it was in in fact, a pretty hot idea, and it just had a whole cartload of interesting things. It had frames, schemas, had a tax procedure, had general mapping in it, had notions of indefinite contacts, dependence, automatic compilation. Remember, this is all Minsky's frame paper, 75. This is all several years from Minsky's frame paper. Had all these great things in. The only problem is we couldn't make it work, okay? That is, it failed. Now, I need to tell you what it means to say what a failure is. I don't mean that we didn't get a program to make it work. I don't mean that we didn't publish a paper on it. Things exceed in computer science when they affect the course of computer science. And if when you look back five years there's no ripple at all from the papers you published to the system you built, that's a failure. Okay? So my criteria of failure is one we use in tenure committees which is, let's just talk about the way this guy has pushed, or gal, has pushed computer science around. Don't look at the papers, don't look at the systems, only ask how they've pushed computer science around. So in fact, Merlin was really well noticed, it was talked about, it was referenced, it was cited, <laughs> but it turns out that when you're through it, died. No one knows about Merlin now. Its ideas didn't have any issue. Things like the frames and so forth all came around and this was a little input to them, but not the important input. So that counts as a real failure. Uh, furthermore, we didn't even learn that the idea was wrong. It's a very seductive idea. It may actually be right. Okay. Um, I salvaged almost nothing. Almost nothing for, the, uh, for my uh, main goal. Uh, because, in fact, I couldn't learn that the idea was wrong. Except for one small technical idea, which nobody except myself and you all in a moment uh, <laughs> will know about, which is that the way we constructed Merlin, which was this, a structure which was a mapping of something which, when you tried to map 
map it on something else, lead to building a further map, and building a further map in these whole data structures. Um, those are, in fact, local computation. That is, the associated, the associated hash procedure to each mapping, which would be the compilation of how to actually make it work, um, was, in fact, the view from that point, and never a global view of what the entire, uh, the entire cognitive context was. And so what I learned out of that was that we had, in some sense, produced the inverse system from what we wanted to produce. What we really wanted was a system with a single mind's eye. You'll recognize production systems in that. With a single mind's eye that would somehow survey all of this. And not what we had in Merlin, which actually had production systems in, had little production systems all over this big mapping structure. Okay. Small but important technical idea. It's the only thing I took out of it. So let's have another failure. This is the biggest failure of all, by the way. This is something called the Production System Project. It lasted from 76 to 79. A lot of people worked on this. Lanny Ford, John McDermott, Mike Rickner, John Laird, Paul Rosenblum, his young graduate students. The basic idea was to grow production systems by external means. So as opposed to the designer having to know exactly the structure of rules, you sit on the outside and you lost rules into the system and it would sort of grow up. Okay? Um, we actually talked about it a lot as if, as if the goal was to obtain a large production system. In those days that was a thousand, not ten thousand. Okay? We had, no one had reached it, no one was above two hundred. Um, it was, in fact, a total failure. We never got off the ground. One of the ways of, we never produced anything. One of the ways of illustrating this in terms of the publications is there was a prospective paper and there was a retrospective paper, but there were no papers in between. <laughs> <laughs> it, was so, it was so bad, it was so bad that only Mike Rickner, whose loyalty to the project was really very deep, was the only one who was willing to go off and write the retrospective paper. So a genuine failure, okay? And that's what I said, embrace them. Don't hide them, be happy with them. Huh? Now, it turns out that it had an incredible set of uses. So in fact, the whole op series of production systems, OPS standing for Official Production Systems for the Instructable Production System Project, because we all had our own version, was generated by that process, by that, by this project. It turns out that in the, as we struggled to find some tasks for which this poor beginning system... Oh, I have to hear what's wrong with the system. Didn't tell you that. The real problem is... Oh, maybe I'll say it later. I can't remember. The real problem is that if you're sitting on the outside, you dump a production system in, you can't ever do anything to evoke that production. Production is up there someplace with its conditions. You don't know what it is because you don't know the productions that are in there. That's the whole point. And you're fishing around trying to find some way to make it fire. And you can't do that, so we could never get, it wasn't quite that bad, but it was almost that bad. We could never get a scheme which let the thing sort of turn over so you could shape it. Okay? Um, and trying to find some tasks like this on McDermott. Picked up a task that Sam Fuller had at Digital Equipment, uh, which turned out to be this, this VAX configuration task. And so the R1 expert system, which many of you will know because it was the first really successful commercial expert system grew directly out of this project. The notion of universal weak methods, something that John Laird and I did, grew out of this project. And in fact, Mike went and had a fairly large influence around campus in getting engineering AI going and engineering systems. So the yield for this failure is actually pretty good. So what did I want? What did I salvage from this? Because success, that is yield in terms of uses of the failure, sort of helps just by spending all of years, but it doesn't lead to the main line. So I salvage essentially several important things. This was the launching pad. This failure was the launching pad for SOAR. It was out of this that we understood that you had to do something, here it is, you had to do something with productions as of a flat organization. You needed to put another organization on top of it. That organization turned out to be problem spaces. We also understood that you needed default methods so that when the system wasn't dealing with your productions that you threw in there, it would always have something to keep it turning over. 
That turned out to be the universal receptor. Both of these turned out to be central and sore. Uh, so it was, in fact, the launching pad. So the yield was pretty good. Uh, the only remark I would make about both of these failures is, again, failures can last a long time. If you look at that, that's a lot of years. If you look at the other one, wherever is the other one, that's even more years. So again, long life health. Now, there's just two failures. I don't want you to believe that I only had two failures in my life, so I'm not going to go over them, but there's a list of failures I could talk about if we really want to go back and focus on my failures. But versions and failures are not the only things to worry about in trying to achieve that scientific goal. Uh, there are successes on some problems and the fact that these become abandoned opportunities. So the maxim is, so, I mean, if you're going to go for this goal, then you got to solve whatever problems are in the way of whatever character, okay? So you solve whatever problems must be solved. And if you're successful on those, then your problem is not to be seduced by them. Because these will be big successes. Let me give you some examples. Well, this processing is one, okay? Now, lists are, hot, lists are, viewed, are viewed now as a high idea. You know, a little old by now. But uh, in those days, nobody believed in them, especially the programming systems community. But, uh, but in fact, they had in it the ideas of the processing as developed early, so this back in the 1950s. And only had less the concept of dynamic research allocation. They had the notion of data types. They had the full notion of recursion. They had the notion of generators and working with streams. All of those programming concepts were in here. And in fact, after after a few years of working, the notion of list turned out to be very important. As you know, list is important. Um, big success. The real issue is you can't be seduced into now devoting your life to list processing to such a success. And I succeeded in this one, in fact, in the whole effervescence of a literature, the scientific literature on this product, this programming most built around on list, but that's irrelevant here, like the fun art problem and all the rest of those things. I never participated in this at all. I don't think I ever wrote another article on list processing. So I was not seduced away from my main goal because of the success of list processing. Let's have another one. Hashing. So it turns out that uh, this is not long live. This is sort of the month of July of 61. And it turns out that, that some place on Long Island or something like this, I can't remember, Mark Minsky and I happened to be together sitting down with some obnox obnoxious fellow who uh, kept insisting that the only way you're going to build systems that have the right properties is to not program them but build, build new hardware systems, okay? And so sort of there and over the dinner play, um, we we didn't invent, I'll tell you the rest of the story in a moment, but we sort of used hashing, which was not called hashing at the time, to show that you do with software direct associative addressing and you didn't have to build associative machines, which is what this guy is plugging. You could do it all software, okay? And this was essentially my contribution to this dinner. Um, it turns out that, that uh, uh, hashing had been invented a couple of years before by a bunch of characters working on a disk system called the RAMAC, which in order to deal with the accessing problems, they had invented some clumsy version of, of hashing. Again, not called hashing. I can't remember what they actually called it. They may have called it symbol addressing because that's what I called it. And it took that idea in this very special context, generalized it, saw all the implications of it, it was quite clear what all the kinds of things hashing could do for you in the programming world. Um, but again, I control myself. I wrote one unpublished paper on this. Uh, this, is, this is a historical lie that I do for the purpose of this talk. Sent it off to, sent it off to, to put in his book and, uh, uh, and then went on from there. Even though it was clear how important hashing was, and in fact, one could have gone off down that hashing line Inventing and developing that technology would have been a fairly thoroughly satisfactory, thoroughly satisfactory research career. Let me give you another one: protocol analysis. 
So this again, this is kind of long lasting. This photo goes from 60 to 72, which is a fairly long time. Um, turns out that one needs as a subject to go understand the nature of the mind, an appropriate form of data. And the idea behind protocol analysis is to use the natural language content of people talking about what they are, what's going through their mind at the time that they talk. And, and in the course of working with these early cognitive programs, Herb and I sort of really use that data effectively and reestablish it at all and sort of dumped off as a notion of introspection. Introspection was unreliable. We sort of reestablished this. This is a great idea. In fact, made a very large impact cognitive, in cognitive psychology and cognitive science. Uh, I did, again, I did not follow up on that. What was needed at that point was methodological studies and an attempt to turn protocol analysis into a real engine of research with reliabilities and all the rest of that junk. Okay? And I just didn't do that. Now, I'd like to take complete credit, but I did, in fact, right after this period, engage in a period of automatic protocol analysis. That's one of my failures. Uh, that came to naught. And so I did not, in fact, abandon things the way I should have, allowed myself to be reduced into believing that I ought to continue to spend parts of my life on protocol analysis. Now, the fact that when I list my Vita and all the rest of this stuff, I say, oh, what have I done with my life? Well, I've been all involved in this processing and protocol analysis was the two big things. That shouldn't confuse you. <laughs> all right? I mean, that's just for, that's just for PR. Okay, what, uh, what counts is how are you doing with respect to understanding the nature of the mind. And these things are key sub-problems that have to be solved. But as they turn out to be successful, and these certainly were successful, uh, then you got to, in some sense, you got to know to abandon them, give up all the opportunities they offer. I should go talk to Scott for I'm sure. Give up. That's too deep for most of you, except Scott has balanced his life between neural nets and working on common list and exactly these issues. And uh, he and I ought to talk about that someday. Alright. Uh, I got one more. Success. This is the whole issue of the efficiency of production systems. What are you going to do when you got a hundred thousand productions? How are you going to be able to select those rules in a tenth of a second or a hundredth of a second? Now, in fact, we've been working on this from 76, and we're still working on it. So this is really long line. Um, there are, in fact, a whole set of important ideas that have developed. This is a little area within the uh, issue now of parallel processing, of the read algorithm, fine-grained parallelism, sensitive chunks, unique attributes. Haven't abandoned it yet because we haven't gotten the success out of it that we need so that all of our big production systems are working successfully on parallel processors. Um, uh, I hope I have the courage to abandon it when the time comes. So, uh, so the points I want to note about this is success can last a long time too, not just failures, um, but you should never ultimately be diverted, and that remark that I made earlier, it does help to have a long life because you're going to have 10 year diversions and 10 year successes on some problems, you've got to have some time to come back and work on the main thing. So I'm finally through with all of those, but I need to talk just about success a little bit. So here is successes and their cultivation. And there are two maps associated with this. One, whoops. When you make a success, when you get an insight into the essential problem that you're working on, you'll preserve it. Don't let it go. You work on it and deepen it. In fact, any really deep idea is to transform itself radically over time and requires the kind of care and tending for that to happen. The reason that's so important is that deep scientific ideas are exceedingly simple and almost everyone else will see them as trivial. Okay? Consequently, you'll be the only one to be able to cultivate them for a number of years. So here's a list of what I consider to be sort of essential good ideas. Uh, kind of unimportant what the list is, list processing search, symbols, problem spaces, weak methods, production systems, knowledge, low chunking, impasses, um, all of which, almost all of which, the 
the story isn't quite the same for each one of them, all of which have this property, they are simple ideas, and that over the years, each one of these comes deeper and transforms, and, and transforms itself. I'm only going to give you a single example of that. So here's the issue of problem spaces. I could have picked several other ones, though this was sort of probably the best one to illustrate it. Um, this idea is so trivial as to be interesting to almost everybody. I, okay? um, which is to say is, it sort of says if you're going to do search, you're going to do a state space. State space, what's the big deal? We all know what state spaces are. There are spaces that have states and transitions between. That's all that's to be said about it, except they're kind of a used formalism. Uh, so what is the problem space? The problem space is a set of states, it's a set of operators from state to state, and you have a promise to go from some initial state to any of a set of desired, to one of the desired states by applying that sequence of operators. All is fairly straightforward. But now look what's happened over time. In 57, when this idea first showed up, it was that a search space was the appropriate thing to do heuristic combinatorial search. That is, we were just discovering in AI that there was a combinatorial search problem, and that you had to kind of modulate that with heuristics, and that's why it wasn't called the problem space pipe then, it was like called the space. Um, that was the initial idea. But by 65, this idea had transmuted into that is a space in which all problem solving occurs. That is, when you look at any difficult problem solving, it always occurs in some problem space. That wasn't clear up here at all. There were some problems that formulated this well. Okay? So that's a significant change. In uh, a few years later, I, go, I can't quite on the date, the idea surfaced, the idea was finally understood that unlike simple little AI programs, real human intelligence is dealing with, has such a huge body of knowledge that its problem is that for any task it wants to do, it must select out a small arena in which to do this task and get rid of almost everything else that it wants to do. So there is a deliberate limitation to an arena. And the problem space is the notion that relates to how the human limits the arena. Whether in fact it used it for search or not is irrelevant. There's this notion of limiting the arena because a human can do so many other things. It couldn't possibly in some sense consider all of them or bring all of that knowledge or ask about all of that knowledge. It's got to impose, and this is, this is done deliberately of course, so we can change that arena and work on a problem in a different way. By 1979, this notion had gotten enriched because it wasn't just problem solving. That should have been not the area, it should have been the arena again, in which the problem space was the organization in which all cognitive activity was supposed to occur, was to occur. Okay, these are all hypotheses, of course, about the nature of human behavior, hypotheses which most of the rest of the AI and cognitive world is not paying much attention to. This concept is sort of getting deeper and deeper as it goes along. Uh, so that shift from just problem solving to all cognitive behavior, routine and otherwise, to be accomplished within problem spaces. Uh, it seems incredible now that all the way through this, one only talked about single problem spaces. And so the idea got changed in 83 with the essentially the development of impassing and universal sub building and so forth, to the fact that one now has multiple problem spaces and that the relationship between those problem spaces was not implementation, but was a lack of knowledge in this problem space about how to do things would lead to the setting up another problem space. And so that enriched the notion of the role of problem spaces in cognitive behavior. There was now to be a whole web of them. But I think the biggest transformation occurred in 87, in which problem spaces all of a sudden turned out to be a least commitment to program control construct. Okay? Let me try and explain that. It turns out that what you want in an intelligent system is not to commit itself in advance.
advance to how you're going to control things, but to wait to the very last minute to assemble the knowledge right then in order to do control. And so if you separate all of control knowledge from all of the things you do, the operators, that is a problem. So here it is having nothing to do with search at all, but being fundamentally a control construct. And the way we arrived at this actually was by observation of SOAR, in which having been imbued with search all the way through this, we sort of looked at SOAR, and SOAR most of the time wasn't doing any search. And when you ask, well, what was the, was the problem space doing, doing all of that time, the answer was, it was being this control construct of delaying to the moment of action the assembly of control knowledge that might have been generated just a little bit before in order to do the control at that point. But we're not through yet. In 1990, which is sort of the, <coughs> this is actually a, a little out of time, but I'll just let it go. Um, the idea that, that an intelligent system has the problem of how it formulates tasks out of nothing. Where do tasks come from? The programming world says a task comes because a human has a task and it puts that task into a program. Therefore, don't ask. You know, I'll be quiet. Tasks come from humans. We don't ever have to ask how they come. But if you're talking about what is the nature of human cognition, you must say, how does a human who doesn't have a task arrive at that task in the first place? And it turns out that the problem space becomes the device for how to formulate tasks out of nothing, in addition to all of these others. Um, and then the last one has a question mark because we know it's there, but it's totally undeveloped. The problem space is a generalized device for error recovery, which is to say that there I am in this problem space, which is a search space, and any time an error happens, I am already embedded in the larger context in which I can consider alternatives. So that error recovery becomes a very different kind of situation than it is in most programming systems. That is an undeveloped idea, but I assure you it's there. So here's one, here's one simple concept. Yet over time, by nurturing it, it has turned out to be an exceedingly rich construct, and I assume it's going to go on, it's going to go on from there. There's a simple a story that we told for some of the others. Um, I'm not looking at my wife anyway, but I assume I don't have time to talk about those. So, uh, so let's talk about choosing the final project. Uh, the maxim here is choose a final project that will outlast you. My uh, my best example of this is an economist by the name of Fritz Machlet. Uh Fritz is a fairly famous economist at Princeton. Um, had worked in all kinds of areas in, in, in economics. Had published in 1962 a book called um, Knowledge and its Distribution in the United States, which was sort of trying to show that it really was a knowledge industry, and from an economic point of view, you really ought to track the knowledge. Uh, characterize it, do statistical studies on it, and so forth. When Fritz retired from Princeton at the usual retirement time, um, he said, what I want to do is to write an eight-volume study, which is going to have, like the Canucci, right? It's going to have a volume for every chapter of the previous book, which really treats this right, okay? As time went on, it got expanded to be a ten-volume study and so forth. And, um, and when Fritz had a heart attack at age 80, he was up to volume four, um, and he clearly had succeeded in picking a project which outlasted him, and so he died with his pen in his hand, which is exactly the right way to die. <laughs> The source, so well, that's one thing, and the, uh, the other maxim I would have you attend to uh, is that everything must wait until it's time. Uh, science is genuinely the art of the possible, and that's going to be reflected in this list. Um, so source seems like a typical final project, especially you see it now, in which it's clearly going to outlast me. Right? Uh, look what has to be done for source. A couple of these we've done, but most of them we haven't. It's got to have the right architecture. It's got to learn continuously from experience. It's got to communicate with the external world easily. Okay, so that's some years from now. Yes. It's got to learn continuous from its environment, not just from its internal experience, to sort of what it does now. It's got to live a long time, okay? Uh, maybe not 10 to the 9th decision cycles, but 10 to the 7th decision cycles at least, okay? Um, it's got to keep you telling you, it's got 
Your body, all of its tasks simultaneously. You can't build one storage system for this and one storage system for that. You've got to put everything in the same thing because that's what's true of your cognition. It's got to become very large. It's got to have 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 productions or associations of what you call them. Uh, we're only up to 10,000. Very started. It has to have a, history of, a, history, a sense of history in place. In modern terms, it's got to be situated, okay? Um, it's got to be a system with a sense of self. You've got to learn from a social community. All of these things are real problems. All of them, if I take one to Riker's view, are each worth five years. All right? So clearly, I don't have a chance, okay? Some place down in here. Um, so, so it will surely outlast me, and so I've essentially done exactly what Fritz Mach have done. Except that's all not true. So it is not a final product. Um, it's simply the next project that comes along. In fact, if you look at the time it was chosen, which was 83, I was only 56 at the time, much too early to be choosing the final project. Uh, the choice, however, was it strategic. It was finally coming back and picking as a goal all the things that were focused on that central desire to understand the nature of the human mind. The fact that you see such a massive commitment to it is really, I won't go through this, because we already have kind of it's really like that it turns out to be a confluence of so many things that seem, that seem right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so that's about it. Uh, so I sort of sprint throughout this thing a bunch of maxims, which I think, at least when I hear, I, when I hear myself saying them to my graduate students, I, uh, I think that they probably characterize my, uh, my own scientific life. Uh, so the maximum that holds for this last slide is uh, sweet scientific style, its own maxims. The maxims that I've told you about don't necessarily apply to scientific styles. On the other hand, there are in fact a, uh, a bunch of maxims which didn't quite make it in that particular way of viewing my, uh, my scientific life, and I thought that a suitable uh, uh, sort of uh, tattered way of ending this talk would be to just go over some of the other maxims um, uh, that I have found useful and that, in fact, I think are entirely appropriate for the scientific style in which I've lived, but not necessarily other ones. So here's the first one. Uh, so this is a random collection. This is a random residual. So first one, if you want to work with the results of field X, you've got to be a professional in X, to wit, no interdisciplinary activity. Uh, and I've got some good examples of this. In cognitive psychology, which is central for me, is central for me in understanding the nature of human cognition, I had to become a cognitive psychologist. I couldn't depend upon my cognitive psychological friends. Okay, now in fact, what that means, as some of the psychologists around here will verify is, psychologists have a way of dealing with issues. They sit there and they sort of shout studies at each other. <laughs> and one person says, the study by so and so so is this, and you've got to respond, oh, the study is flawed in this particular way. To so which someone else says, but this study shows this, and you say, but I have another study which shows this. Okay, now, in fact, that's the way cognitive psychologists talk when they're together. Um, if you can't talk that way, if it turns out that you don't know essentially every study is laid on the conversational table, you are not a cognitive psychologist. Being a cognitive psychologist means to immerse yourself so deeply in cognitive psychology that you can play that game. And I did, and I do play that game. Okay, I got a bunch of interesting anecdotes I won't tell you but could about that. <laughs> On the other hand, the linguists play a different game. They play a game of making up counterexamples, make up these interesting sentences which they zing at each other across the, <laughs> across the table. And you have to deal in real time online with all those counterexamples by making up other counterexamples examples of own or denying the fact that that's grammatical or whatever. <laughs> a very different game from what the cognitive psychologists do. Now, it turns out, well, I don't, I don't know about the neuropsychologists, they're so embedded in anatomic language that I can't even follow it. <laughs> but it turns out that this one I did, and these two I didn't. And so consequently, I have never have been crippled this way. I have never in all of my professional life really dealt with linguistics adequately and I certainly have been unwilling, unwilling to deal with brain damaged patients and studies and information and so forth. 
what's now called neurocognitive psychology, uh, simply because in some sense I wasn't a professional in, these, in either of these areas, and so it wasn't safe for me to go use them. And I think this is true. I don't, don't believe it when they tell you what you need to do is to collaborate with a psychologist and he will do this for you, or he will do this for you. They won't and they can't. If you want to work across fields, you become professionals in both fields. Second one, we are all flawed. Okay? Um, we all carry our burden of incapacities, and you want the real thing about that is you want to know them like the back of your hand, and you don't want to fight them. In my own case, the issue is I'm not a mathematician. Now, I know I'm not a mathematician because, in fact, I spent a year as a graduate student at Princeton in Fine Hall, which is the temple of pure mathematics. Okay? And I came away from that understanding that I was never going to be a real mathematician. I was never going to prove any of those deep theorems. In fact, I was never going to prove any of those deep theorems. Okay? <laughs> and I have designed my scientific life in the sense to simply deal with that. I don't fight it. I know that I'm limited in that respect, and so I work with the things when I'm strong. I understand my flaws and I stay away from them. Here's a hard one. There is no substitute for working hard, very hard, okay? I tell this to my graduate students all the time. Um, just like in professional sports, in professional music, on the concert stage, and so forth. The people who are out there and are going to get the goal, the people who are going to find out what the nature of the mind is, is the people who are not only brilliant and creative, but work very hard. And you can be as brilliant as you want, and as creative as you want, and if you don't work hard, someone's going to get there first. Okay, it's a hard story, but it's very, very true. If you don't want to work that hard, don't go after the scientific style of picking up one of these goals. And you look around and you see that's really true about the scientists who have made those in a goal. And it just comes out of this notion of competition at the margin of excellence. And that's all that's going on. It's just as of professional sports as it is science. But unfortunately, it's just as true of science as it is professional sports. <laughs> all right. So how do new things get started? In all of the experience I've had, I always get started by evolution. That is, we're in a situation like that big failure, and out of that failure comes the, the ashes, which tell that instructable production system problem, which tell you how to proceed next. That happens all the time in every scientific endeavor. Or they come from chance. I didn't ask Oliver Selfridge to visit that day. Oliver arrives, I know him from Adam. Um, he gives these talks. There I am. I'm hooked for the rest of my life. Okay, they do not happen by design. I have designed a large number of starts in my life. Almost all of them have gone down the tubes. So I designed this inductible production system project. <coughs> Didn't work. So, so the next one, okay, so that's all. So here's another version that I feel most deeply about. A scientist is a transducer from nature to theory. Kid yourself that you have very much to offer. Your problem is to go listen to nature, transduce what it has to say into a theory, but don't believe that the theory is the theory is coming from you, it's coming from nature. So oh, the name of the game is to seek out nature and listen to it. Back in the cities, whenever I used to go home kind of depressed because I felt I hadn't learned anything in a week, I would take a new protocol. And I would take an evening and I would clear the evening away. And I'd spend an evening with that protocol and I would always find out something about human behavior that I didn't know. Okay, I just listen to nature. Those of you who uh, to hear me say on, uh, on SOAR, listen to the architecture, it's just a version of that same maxim. Uh, this is simply my version of herbs have a secret weapon. Here the secret weapon is every scientist should have a piece of nature that nobody else knows about that you can listen to that tells you what to do. I don't know what the mathematicians do. On that. <laughs> but then I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> All right. So here's the last one. The science is in technique. All else is commentary. All right. All that lives, all that lives in science 
are those techniques, based on theory of course, but are those techniques which your scientific descendants must use to solve their problems. We know about Hamilton because of a thing called the Hamiltonian, and there's just a bunch of problems in physics which you wish to formulate with Hamiltonians. Okay. And we don't know about a bunch of other characters because their formulations were either too general or they weren't interesting enough. So it's the, it's the, the technique that you build that really count. And all the general theories and the points of view and the commentaries on them are all fluff and they don't really count. Okay. And so you got to keep that in mind. For instance, to pick an example, of, I had a fellow on the SOAR project who went to a meeting recently. And he came back and he said, everyone there is all enthused about connectionism. Okay? And he says, I need to write articles to tell them about these other kinds of architecture so they won't be so enthused about connectionism. And I said, forget it. I said it a little bit. So I said, forget it, because in fact that paper is just talk. That paper is not science, no matter how good it is, even if you persuade a few people. The real issue is, what techniques will you build that your descendants will have to use solve their problems. And in fact, if you look over my scientific career, you will see a whole number of places, like the GOMS models, where we, and problem behavior graphs, which I didn't talk about here, where we deliberately attempted to package our scientific results as techniques that could be used by future generations of scientists. Sometimes we were successful, sometimes we weren't. I'm not going to talk about this, but I will sort of say what it's all about. Um, this article says that if you have an urge to talk generally, um, so do it at invited talks like this one, um, <laughs> or do it on the banquet circuit. Uh, don't kid yourself that these general papers are in fact the stuff out of which your real science, your real science is made. Um, so that's sort of it. Uh, I could have, I could have actually started out this, uh, this whole talk by giving a maxim from my, my father. My father was a great maxim maker. Um, and I suppose I should say it the way Lyndon Johnson did, you know, what my dad told me, okay? Uh, and what he used to say is, and he said it incessantly. <laughs> he always said, keep your eye on the main chance, okay? And if I'd have started out with that maxim, then I probably wouldn't have even had a talk to give because that's part of the magnet that covers all the things that I've said in this talk. Thank you.